there everybody, Dakion here with another review for you, this time of a role-playing game called River of Heaven Science Fiction Role-Playing in the 28th Century. It's by D101 Games. What is this? It's, as it says, a science fiction role-playing game using uh, a ver variation on the basic role-playing uh, mechanics. Uh, specifically the open quest um, system, which is a kind of a stripped-down BRP. Uh, I believe it's officially based on the SRD for the Mongoose version of RuneQuest. And that open quest, by the way, is also published by D101 Games. I think they're called. Uh, I think, uh, anyway. Uh, it's... I, I don't want to go into a long rant on the history of BRP here. If you don't know what BRP is, it's uh, essentially the idea of <clears throat> resolving uh, um, uncertain events in a role-playing game by simply having a percentage chance and then rolling percentile dice. This was introduced by the Chaosum back in the 70s, in, in originally in a game called RuneQuest, and then in Call of Cthulhu. And it is a very good mechanic as far as uh, transparency and intuitiveness goes. I mean, everybody who has learned about percentages in school understands the idea that, okay, my skill is 45%. What does that mean? Well, it means I have a 45% chance of accomplishing something. It's so obvious. It's not hidden behind any arcane dice combinations or, or dice pools or, or any other weird rules. The possible disadvantage of BRP is that it is so simple that it can be hard to allow for gradations in, in the resolution. And it also has some baggage in the form of tacked-on mechanics from back from the 70s, like legacy mechanics that weigh it down in a modern age. Um, open Quest is the idea of Open Quest, uh, which is also used in this game, is to remove some of that unnecessary complexity and strip it down, as I've mentioned before. And it does it fairly well. It's not the best implementation of BRP I've seen, but it's pretty good. And it's completely usable and functional. What In this book, we do not get much pure system. It's 246 pages. Of, of those, I would say about 45 to 50 are pure setting information. And the rest, almost 200 pages, is application of system to setting. Some of that is possible to apply to general sci-fi settings. You can strip it out of the, this particular setting and apply it somewhere else. Some of it is more difficult to do that with. The, um, the asking price for it, if you want a hardcover, is about $40 off DTRPG. The introductory chapter has some general stuff like what's a role-playing game and blah blah blah, and you, you don't care about that. You want to know what is this setting. Well, it's uh, pretty far in the future. It has uh, sentient AIs. It has transhumanism. And as in humans are augmented by mechanical and biological means. It also has sublight star travel. It includes a fictional timeline with very distinct eras. One of these is the default setting. And some... ideas are presented for playing in other eras. I'm going to talk later about how easy that is to do with the rules as given, though. And as is traditional, chapter 2 is character generation. It's functional. It's not difficult to understand if you're a role-playing gamer. It has a system for personality traits that same seems, seems fine. Uh, the transhumanism comes to the fore because all characters by default are augmented. They have six points for augmentations they can buy. 
the only real question I have about character generation is that they have uh, both a point by method and a random method for generating stats. And depending on which subspecies of human you go with, you get various amounts of points and or uh, die rolls given for random stat generation. And the thing is, these two systems give extremely different results. I mean... You really want point by to be the baseline, but um, and and for a random distribution to give on average as many points as the point by gives you, but that's not the case here. That's not in in almost any of these subspecies, and depending on which you choose, it can be more or less advantageous. If if you're going point by, being a normal human, a baseline human is the best thing to do because they get the most points. But if you're not going point by, if you're going random, you definitely want to be uh, gen genetically engineered, so-called genie, or or, uh, or even a bioroid, which is essentially a replicant from, um, <laughs> from um, Blade Runner. So I'm, I'm not quite sure what they were thinking there. Oh well, let's move on. Um, now, I, I was a little confused by by the skill um, distribution. No matter what your concept for the character, no matter what kind of, of character you're making, you get the same pools of points. You get 50 points on resistances, 50 points on combat skills, 50 points on knowledge skills, and 75 points on practical skills. You get the same amount of combat skill points no matter whether you make a soldier or a civilian, in other words. Which seems a little odd, but I suspect they're just trying to make balanced characters because at the end of the chapter they have optional character generation rules wh where you have specialists and veterans and so forth and you can get different uh, point spreads. The chapter on skills, I there's nothing to say about it. They have the thing. The thing with any D hundred based game is choosing your skill list when you're designing the game, so you don't have too few or too many skills. If you, you don't want to subdivide them too far but then you don't want to have just a few skills that are so general that they can do anything. And it's... yeah, I, I, I think the list of skills they've come up with is, seems workable. It's pretty good. They're described well and distinct from each other. And uh, yeah, I like it. Next chapter is Augmentation. And here we immediately get what I think is the first real typo as in as in mistake in the rules the calculation for bioenergy points here on page 49 does not match what was given earlier in the character uh, chapter also this paragraph uh, contradicts itself within a few lines with you know between the first two sentences so I, I suspect this paragraph is just completely wrong uh, and needs to be uh, jettisoned Otherwise, augmentations obviously are important in this universe because they get their own chapter. My um, questions lie in, in two areas. First, they have different types of augmentation, biotech, cyberware, nanotech. But just about everything described in the, the chapter is biotech or nanotech. Cyberware is in the default setting. Um, has been bypassed. It's it's too old, and, and uh, there is only I think a single cyberware augment given in the examples. Um. So so there's a um, uh, there's a gap in the writing here because in in the text it seems like cyberware is still useful, but in this chart 
there's none to be found. The other more important thing is that certain of the augments are simply pointless. Um, say, for example, flexibility, which is an active concentration trait that gives plus 10 for magnitude on athletic skill. Why would you ever take that given that you can have combat reflexes, which is also active, it doesn't even need concentration, it gives you plus 10 to athletics, but also per magnitude, but also to dodge, and plus 2 to combat order. Th this is superior in every single way. Uh, I don't know why. If not, maybe flexibility is cheaper to buy in, in, in like, the in-game currency, maybe? Otherwise, I don't see any point to it. Oh well. Um, when it comes to buying things, the next chapter is, of course, equipment. And it starts out with a chapter not about personal equipment, but about inter interplanetary trade. It makes some good points about how trade would work in a setting like the one described. Um, these lists of equipment, like like the e augments, assume you're playing at the optimal tech level for the setting and the timeline. So, if you want to go hopping between planets with with uh, varying tech levels or play in another time period, you're gonna have to do some work of your own. Next chapter is combat which has a reasonably medium complexity BRP variant. Um, there's a few questions I have. Uh, the main one, given that the this chart of modifications, it, it one of the good things about OpenQuest is they, they have no small piddling modifications. It's, it's big chunks of 20 or... 25 or 50 percent that's good it says this this um these modifiers are not cumulative you just use the best one but in that case i think a few of them should be higher actually i you know being prone or attacked from behind plus 25 sure but if you're helpless totally helpless that should be more than plus 25 that should be at least plus 50 Oh well, that's easy to um, uh, house rule. A few other odd things is that there is no all-out defense action. There is an all-out attack, but there is no way to just go purely defensive, which is normally something you can do in BRP games. And it doesn't specify the action cost of a changing stance. Uh, from where it's placed in the rules text, I can assume it counts as a move, but it could have been more clear. Uh, auto fire always raises questions. <laughs> there is no BRP game where it does not. Uh, I don't think I've ever seen a good, clear set of rules for automatic fire. Unfortunately, it's one of the big mysteries of, of this game system. Um, but moving on, we get a chapter on transportation, which, given this is sci fi, largely means. Uh, Spaceships, but in general, vehicles are important in sci-fi. So there is a, a basic uh, vehicular combat system included. It's based to a large extent on detection, which seems reasonable given the um, time period. The important thing is not if you can hit the enemy because you have so many guidance systems. The important thing is who detects who first, who, whose electronic countermeasures fail first. Um, I'd like to. I have to point out that there is no PC-controlled interstellar travel. You can't have the free trade of Beowulf as a traveler, because the the um, secrets of space travel are kept by a guild. It's, it's kind of like in Dune, where where they you know they need the navigators who can sort of. Um, take a drug that that lets them see through hyperspace or whatever in in this game it's not that um, um, it's not that 
out there, but it is the case that certain humans need to be very heavily modified to be Starship pilots, and they become almost inhuman, and these people are very strongly controlled by their guild, and you need one of those people to fly a spaceship. You can't do it on your own. So that sort of limits the mobility, interstellar mobility of the players. Next we get into the G Game Masters section. We have first the mission, which is by which they mean adventures. It's largely about how to construct adventures, it has some good ideas about that. It also has some ideas about rewards and improvements of characters after a mission. And it has some spot rules for what are mostly environmental effects. This is also traditional in the DFP game. You have, some, have to have some rules for encumbrance and falling and exposure and thirst and fatigue, fire and heat and poison and disease and all that good stuff. Um, the only real issue I have here is that <clears throat> In the example of play given, at the end when they're tallying up all their improvement points and whatnot, uh, the final totals don't add up with what they actually describe in the text. Uh, so there's some typos there. But they're easy to spot if you're doing the calculations by yourself. Now we get into the actual setting portion. It starts with a bright age, which describes the um, the history and timeline for the setting, uh, with with some emphasis on on the main uh, main uh, era they expect you to play in. Um, I you know I, as as far as I could be bothered to pay attention while skimming through this, I uh, I thought it was uh, funny that. Obviously, this was not written by an historian because they describe the second industrial revolution as happening in 2046. <laughs> uh, yeah. Oh, well. In case you didn't know, the second industrial revolution is already a term in history, and it happened in the late 19th century. Um, I mean, we, we in, in some respects, we're going through the third industrial revolution uh, in the late 20th, early 21st century. So, so in 2046, they would have to be in their fourth revolution. At least. Oh well. There's also a strange thing in, where in 2107 they're making a point of something continually breaking UN rules and UN law. But earlier they described the UN as basically being defunct by 2050. So. Mm, not sure what's going on there. There's a few other unclear events, but you don't need to be exact with everything here. Uh, next up is the hegemony, which describes uh, the Kantari hegemony, the uh, government of the Alpha Kantari star system. This is intended to be the, the default setting where you're starting out. It describes the politics and, and I suppose, sort of geography of the system. It shows you... Uh, uh, the stars, two stars and the plants surrounding them, and yeah, there's nothing to comment on here really. Uh, Islands in a Sea of Stars is the broader um, cosmology. It gives brief descriptions of all the worlds that are inhabited by humans in this future world. And yeah, again, nothing much to say about that. Chapter 12, Adventure Seeds. It has six sketches of adventures, each one with setup and three uh, possible twists, optional twists, which I think is a nice way to describe things. And they all seem, you know, like good starting points to make an adventure. Uh, 13, Friends and Foes is your monster manual. It includes ideas for creating new beings of your own, and it has a lot of stats for, well, starting out with the pouring old animals from old earth and there's alien beasts with of course an emphasis on the kind of predators that would actually try to eat a human 
Um, also, some human bad guys. And I have not gone over all these stats with a fine tooth comb. I do not have that sort of time and patience anymore. It's not like when I was a teenager and could only afford to buy like one well playing book, you know, every few months, and I read every single line of it over and over. And I'm sort of spoiled for choice these days. So I, I tend to skim these books a lot. And finally, we have a reference section, which is quite an eclectic list, but has some interesting ideas in it. So what are my conclusions? Well, system-wise, this is perfectly functional. A few things need to be clarified and house ruled and whatever, but that's the case with almost any game, and an experienced game master shouldn't have any trouble with it at all. The setting, yeah, that's functional too, but here's the issue with rules functionality is all that i ask for with setting i ask for more i want it to wow me or at least enthuse me in some way and this setting doesn't do that it's kind of milk toast i have to say it's it's just kind of there i but you know I have also complained against too detailed settings in the past, so I should be careful what I wish for, I suppose. The thing with this setting is that it is actually just a sketch. It gives you broad outlines. You can fill them in and you can change things around to suit yourself. If you have a strong concept of your own, you can kind of twist this game to suit that concept. Um, like I mentioned, if you're playing in the setting but in a different time period, you're going to have to make up a lot of house rules of your own, mostly for the technology. Um, I suppose you could mostly just take the stuff in the book and make it more expensive or slightly less efficient. But yeah, B because uh, you would normally play in, a, in an earlier time period. Uh, the default setting is, is pretty late in the history of humankind. Uh, the timeline does go slightly past the, um, the default setting, but if you're playing that far out in the future, you're going to have to really wing it. So, yeah, I, I would say if you want uh, a nice... Um, clean gaming system, a setting that isn't interfering with your own ideas too much, uh, sure, this is a very good buy. If you, But if you, what you're looking for is a game where the setting itself will motivate you and make you enthusiastic to play it, this is not it, unfortunately. Those are my conclusions. So, with that, this is Dakiyan, and for now, I'm signing off.